come up. Um, could you hold up your phones really quickly? Just as fast as you can. All right, there we go. Some of you are more reluctant. Some of you are more excited about this. Um, but the idea is that the faster you held up those phones, the more cyborg-like you are. And we're all cyborgs. You don't need to be Terminator. You don't need to be Robocop. The word cyborg actually came from a 1960 paper on space travel. The idea was you're a cyborg if you attach something external to yourself to adapt to a new environment. And that's it. So we have been cyborgs since the beginning of time, since we used hammers as extensions of our fists or knives as extensions of our teeth. But when we started writing and storytelling, we started having these technologies be extensions of our mental selves. And this changes over time. Unlike a tool like a hammer that stays the same shape and function and size for two million years, what our devices look like and what shape and size they are and how we use them are completely different. Just between 10 years uh, and another 10 years, the form doesn't necessarily follow the function. And in a way, we're in what Douglas Rushkoff likes to call present shock, not even future shock anymore, because we're just trying to catch up with the present moment. And interestingly enough, I somehow I have the wrong slide deck. Uh, there's a different slide deck that I sent for this, but I'm just going to give the talk as if I would. So, um, so a lot of the problems that we have with this are that there's all sorts of information in here that you don't even notice at any given moment. We're carrying around all of this, a kind of Mary Poppins bag style of technology. And we have these kind of hyperlinked memories that we have to remember on each point in time. And if you lose all of that, you lose access to those memories. So if suddenly your hard drive crashes, you have this immeasurable sense of loss because you didn't really notice what was inside there. The internet becomes a kind of playground and factory as we all become employees of each corporation that we use in our free time. Um, and we already kind of have a virtual reality. Everything that we do gives us a plus one and has a certain psychological effect attached to it. When we think about uh, ancient Egyptians and how they had entire walls full of minutia and moments that were carved in, now everybody has one of those with a Facebook wall. This is an art project that I did where I put all of my information up on a Facebook wall and made it printed out the size of an actual wall so that everybody could see my personal information to kind of replicate this and try to ask the question of whether we would be in a digital dark age if we lost any of this information or whether it was actually useful at all. What of us, what of your lives will be remembered when you're sitting there on your deathbed in 20 years? The Greeks had two concepts of time. One is chronos time and one is kairos time. And this kind of chronos time was the idea that it's kind of this industrialized time. You have a meeting at 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. You discuss a very specific thing. And then you have Kairos time, the time where you don't notice time, the time of falling in love, the time where you lose track of time. And I think a lot of the moments that we have in our lives are these kind of Kronos times, where we're trying to dig through this kind of new uh, paleontology, where we're going through and waiting for all of this email to show up and digging through that email, and remembering the keyword, and trying to, to get that back. And we kind of had the social punctuation where everything is constantly interrupting us. How many of the notifications that you get on your phone are actually from people? And how many of them are from robots? If you take five minutes and you actually get rid of a bunch of the information on your phone, just the alerts, how much time will you actually get back? How much human time will you get back? Can you put your phone on airplane mode sometimes so that the device time, the chronos time, isn't just subjecting you to that time at every moment. How much can you be self-reflective? Is there a potential to spend one day a week without any technology at all? There are some cultures that do this already, but what would you do in that day? How do you reconcile the idea of not having anything to do and being sitting there with your own internal self? This continuous partial attention that we have is always about the next moment that we're technically producing. Instagram has an algorithm where if you put something online, maybe you'll get 50 likes, and the next time you post something, you might get 12 likes instead. 
and this is to get you into a state where you're upset, that you, don't, that you think, oh, I did something wrong, I didn't work with something the right way, and therefore I have, to, I have to do better next time. And then you're thinking about, in this insecure way, the way that you can post something. So these moments of self-reflection, how do we get that back? We need a kind of calm technology. And a calm technology actually came from Xerox PARC in the 80s and 90s. And what happened with this technology is that Mark Weiser and John Seeley Brown realized that what happened when they created all these different devices is that the scarcest thing would no longer be that technology. It would be our attention and how technology made or, break, or made or broke our attention would make or break that technology in the future. So designing Calm Technology was a series of principles. And one of the principles was that technology should take the least amount of your attention and only when necessary. An example of this is a tea kettle. Another example of this is electricity. You don't notice when you're using electricity, you walk into your house and you flip the light switch. You don't have to Bluetooth into the app to, to get your access to a, a website that gives you the ability to turn on and off your lights. You can fumble around and click on the light. You only notice the electricity when it's not there. Another principle of calm technology is that you can use external senses. We have all of this attention right here in front of us. Very high resolution attention. And one of the papers that Mark Weiser and John Seeley Brown wrote at Xerox Park is a paper called The World is Not a Desktop. In it, they said, at some point in the future, we will have technology in the shape of pads, tabs, and boards. This is a board, you have pads and tabs in your pockets. And these pads, tabs, and boards would be something that we would constantly be bringing around with us and they would be constantly grabbing our attention. But the point was that instead of sitting there in front of a desktop computer, where you had all of the attention in the world, you had persistent battery life, ethernet connection, and an operating system that came on a CD-ROM that would update every two years and be fairly stable. Computing suddenly became something between human moments. And that becomes a really important thing to think about when we don't know where and when people are using this technology. A car makes very good use of our peripheral attention. And peripheral attention, I mean not just the visual here, but this high resolution takes all of our attention and can give us some information. But we also have peripheral attention. We have attention of being able to hear something. We have the ability to feel a vibration. I had an employee that got an insulin pump installed, and he was really excited to be a cyborg. He said, now I can just be a normal human. Nobody can know that I have diabetes. I have an insulin pump. And we were sitting there in a meeting, and his insulin pump beeped. And he was really upset, and he said, I'm sorry. And I said, you're apologizing on behalf of your technology. Why are you doing that? And he said, I can't turn it off. In weddings and funerals, the device beeps at me, and I can't do anything about it. And when I'm at a loud concert, I can't hear the beep. He had to set his own alarm clock in his pocket to buzz so that he could know when to refill the insulin pump. He called the device manufacturer, and they wouldn't let him change the notification style. And so the thing is, you have to remember that you don't know where people are going to use the technology, and the best thing to do is to allow them to change the notification style. There's a startup that was called PetNet, and PetNet promised that you would never have to feed and water your pets again. So this was the idea that you would put the web-connected app in your house, it would feed and water your pets at specific intervals, and then it would allow you to Skype the pets so you could keep track of them. The problem is that we've had many of these connected pet systems before. They usually just run on a timer. It's not a big deal. This one ran on an external server. So as you can imagine what happened, the server went down and the pets got stranded. This is a kind of new Schrodinger's cat. People were they had no idea where their pets were or how their pets were doing. They were breaking into their homes. They were flying back from international vacations trying to take care of their pets. And the developers of the app, which I talked to, said, oh, I'm sorry, offline support was a feature in version 2. We didn't create this yet. And then in the terms of service, even though on the website they promised this, they said, look, we are not, you agree that in using this app, you're not responsible 
for 100% uptime for this app. You're, we're not responsible for taking care of your pets. You agree that at some point, things might go wrong. Please have a backup system. This is supposed to be your backup system. My concern is that when we build technology like this and we rush to get it to market, we forget about what happens when things go wrong. If we create technology that assumes that we'll have limited bandwidth, limited battery life, and when it breaks, it still works, we'll have really good technology. But most people don't think of it that way. A lot of the times, we have technology that's built in optimal conditions, in perfect conditions, where you have great battery life, well-lit conditions, you have very good bandwidth. I want to see people testing technology on public transportation underground with 2% battery life, where people are in a panic, and it's really loud and there's an alarm going. And that would be a different way to test the technology. Another principle of Calm Technology is that we should amplify the best of what humans can do and the best of what technology can do. Humans are really good at curation and context. We know what we want. We know the information that we need. But in a lot of cases, people are trying to make machines that act like humans. If you've ever answered one of those phone calls that has a robotic phone tree, you know what I mean. You end up, especially if you have any other than a San Francisco accent, you end up yelling at it again and again and again and trying to enunciate because it doesn't necessarily understand you. It's trying to be a human. When things get really, really automated, the most important thing is customer service. I've been stuck between borders and airports because I accidentally folded the QR code on my flight ticket, and I had to wave around to find a surveillance camera to try to get somebody to come by, a physical human, and let me in. Google does a really good job of this. It's matching you with a lot of information that has already been there from other people, but it's not choosing for you. You are making the choice based on your context. Gary Kasparov has a concept of senators. He says that a mediocre chess player with a pretty good system, a pretty good computer system, can outperform an expert chess player. I think this is a good lesson to be learned. It's not humans against machines or humans reporting to machines. That's not very good calm technology. It's humans alongside machines. Machines do a bit of the work that they're suited to, the pattern recognition, the sorting through lots of data, and then we make the final decision. That way we're not getting caught in these very specific traps. Another principle of calm technology is that technology can communicate, but it doesn't need to speak. If you've ever seen the Roomba robotic vacuum cleaner, it runs around, it's not a very good cleaner, it doesn't have any edges, it doesn't even clean the corners. But when it's done, it goes dun-da-da-da, and when it's stuck, it goes dun-dun. It's not speaking at you like Alexa. It's not trying to tell you, hey, this is the Roomba, and I'm here to clean your floor. It's, it's not trying to be a human. It's just a filter feeder based on a trilobite creature. It's a prehistoric device, basically. And the reason why we like it is because we don't expect to communicate with it in the same way that we would a human. The minute you put voice in an application, people expect to be able to have a conversation in the same way that it speaks to you, which is inherently false. So how do we have a kind of lower level device language? C-3PO might be fluent in two million languages, but he's probably pretty annoying in those two million languages. And R2-D2 is adorable and only has one language. It's universal. He doesn't need to be translated into all these different languages. So this is an important concept to think about because we keep trying to make our devices human, and in doing so, we end up putting humans on pause. Another principle of calm technology is that things should work even when they break. They should gracefully degrade. I see startups trying to make these mobile phone door locks so you could walk up to your house and using Bluetooth, you could unlock your door. But what happens when you're late home from the bar at night and your phone is out of batteries and the Bluetooth won't pair because it's turned off and this requires too much energy and you're stuck outside of your house? What about a, a physical system that allows you to punch a few numbers and then you don't even need a, a key? What about technology that requires the least amount of technology to get the job done? And finally, the last principle of calm technology is that technology sh should fit social norms. Right now, it's normal for all of you in this room to have 
video cameras in your pockets. 15 years ago, it was terrifying that you might be able to take a photo with your phone. It's not that technology isn't ready for humans, it's usually that humans aren't ready for technology. When the first elevators came out, we had to artificially slow them down because people were too afraid of being accelerated that fast. They, they hurt their eardrums. In fact, people were afraid to touch the buttons in the elevator. We had elevator operators, and an elevator operator's union was started in New York so that people could make sure to press the buttons in the elevators. This was a stable job. It wasn't until they went on strike that people realized they could press the buttons in the elevators themselves. <laughs> so it takes a while for us to get accustomed to technology. When you look at a line in the middle of what is the norm, it's basically invisible. We don't notice that we all have phones in our pockets because it's so mundane, it's not a big deal. 15 years ago, that would be enhancing technology. That would be scary because not everybody had it. So anything above this current norm line is kind of enhancing. Anything below that that restores you to the norm is restorative. So glasses restore your sight to the norm, whatever that norm is right now, and they're even decorative. But anything that gives you more superpowers above the norm and is very expensive and out of sight is enhancing, like Google Glass. And Google Glass had a problem where they tried to release 15 different features at once, and people didn't understand what feature to care about. Unlike the iPhone that took 20 years, first a portable Walkman, then the portable Walkman had a touch interface, then the touch interface was, had some apps that were built by Apple, and then you could make your own apps, and then there was GPS, and then you know, it kept going over time. So every few years, there was a digestion period where people got to know the new thing. A 20-year release cycle to get something that was incredibly expensive into the pockets of a lot of people whereas Google Glass expected people to digest 15 different features all at once. And the problem with that is if you expect people to, to digest all of those features at once, they will just focus on the scariest one. Journalists just focused on the idea that it could persistently record you, and there was no record light, there was no kind of calm technology indicator that would give you that information. And so this became a terrifying thing, and it didn't work out. If we had a 20-year cycle, maybe we would be wearing Google Glass in 20 years but everybody would have to be wearing it, or at least a lot of people would have to be wearing it for it to become the norm and for it to become acceptable. And finally, you can use ambient awareness. And ambient awareness is making use of all these different senses to give somebody information in their peripheral attention without overburdening them. When you're driving in a car, you don't have to look at the pedal to press it. It's, it's part of your external awareness. If we were to build a car today, we would have to Bluetooth into all the traffic lights or something like that, and we'd get these counter clocks, and I don't even know what we'd be doing. But the whole point of the car is to get you focused on your primary attention on the road so that you can understand what's going on and everything in the way. And then you have your secondary attention and your tertiary attention on, hopefully, the physical buttons on your radio instead of one of those really big blue touchscreens. And you also have the ability to look at the rearview mirror and keep track of everything with your secondary sense. So if we start to learn and maybe bring back some of these things, like the foot pedal. I don't know where the foot pedal went, but the very first mouse actually had a foot pedal associated with it, so you could kind of scroll down a page by pressing the button instead of getting your wrist hurt. Um, or a trash can. How do you make a sanitary trash can? Use a foot pedal. We've, we've forgotten some of these things. And the whole point of trying to look from the past, from the 80s and 90s and 70s and 60s, is to bring back the concepts that people came up with before technology became a part of everyday life. Going all the way back to the 40s, people were working with anthropologists and technologists at the Macy meetings, and they were talking about concepts like, one day these machines that are size of gymnasiums will get reduced so small that they'll be on our pockets, and that will fundamentally change how we interact with our technology. How will that change culture? And if we look today, we're now in the era that Mark Weiser and John C. Brown predicted at Xerox Park in the 80s and 90s. Mark Weiser isn't around, and he can't talk about this. If you go to calmtechnology.com, you can actually see all of the original papers that he wrote. They're incredibly easy to read, they're beautifully written, they're kind of works of art, and they provide a bit of guidance, not only in ethics and security and personal data and identity from 1994, but the idea that the world is no longer a desktop, and we need to amplify human time instead of machine time so that we can work alongside of our technology 
instead of be used by it. And with that, because my slides stop about here, <laughs> um, I'd like to end. Thank you so much. <laughs>